We are uh, uh, going to ask Nick to stay in place while the chairs are moved. But we're very uh, fortunate to be able to end a perfect day with the Deputy Foreign Minister of Lithuania, Arnoldus Franz Kabiches. And um, anyone who's been looking at the role of Lithuania and realizing the role that it's played in terms of opening a Taiwanese office rather than a Taipei office, um, notices that Lithuania has been playing a very important role in larger foreign policy issues. Lithuania has also withdrawn from the 17 plus one group, the Chinese-led trade and investment initiative. So in addition to the deputy minister's role in Europe, it uh, would be interesting to see how he sees Lithuania's role in the world. So welcome to Deputy Foreign Minister uh, Franz Kavi. Thank you. So we're, we're going to talk about Lithuania becoming a frontline state, literally, of course, as it has been for, for a long time uh, with Russia and, and Belarus. We're definitely going to talk about that. But as, as Joe Nye suggests, uh, and the theme of today demands, uh, you've become a frontline state with China. So let's, let's start with China and, and Taiwan. Uh, so as, a, as Joe just said, um, in May you quit the 17 plus one, which was really China's effort to, be, to, to focus on Central and Eastern Europe rather than the EU as a whole. And you said China should be dealing with all 27 EU members. Uh, in June, Taiwan opened the Taiwanese representative office in Lithuania. That's Taiwan's first new office in Europe in 18 years, and your office in Taipei will still be registered with the Economics Ministry, but it'll be called the Representative Office in Taiwan. This is what Joe said about names, right? Uh, for those of us who know the U.S. and Tecro, that is the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office. So what's in a name? Quite a lot. Beijing's responded by limiting trade, suspending rail service, recalling its ambassador the first time Beijing has ever recalled an ambassador from Europe. So. Is this a diplomatic wake-up call? Thank you, Nick, and great to be here at the Aspen Security Forum. You know, I think it is a wake-up call in many ways, especially for, for fellow Europeans, to understand that if you, you know, want to defend democracy, you have to stand up for it. And uh, in our country, you know, human rights and freedom is not just a given. Uh, it is in our DNA. It goes back to the events 30 years ago when uh, Two million Latvians, Lithuanians, Estonians stood in a Baltic way, in a human chain that, uh, you know, a, a, a in many ways destroyed uh, the, the Soviet Union's uh, soft power on us and, and allowed us to, uh, to dream about rejoining the Western community. And currently, of course, our foreign policy is very much based on, on, on values, on human rights, on democracy, wherever that might be, Minsk or Hong Kong. And therefore, you know, this year, indeed, we took those steps which were not necessarily uh, anti-China, they were pro-Europe. Uh, leaving one plus 17 was uh, also a signal to our European allies that we need to strengthen the EU format with China, 27 plus one. We have to speak in a united and coherent way because otherwise we cannot be credible, we cannot uh, defend our interests, and we cannot have a equal relationship with Beijing. Uh, same goes with our uh, decision uh, to deepen cultural and economic relations with Taiwan. That is a sovereign right of any country, and we have followed 17 other EU member states who have already done so in the past, and we're looking forward with great enthusiasm, especially to that relationship, which promises to be very interesting. So Beijing has retaliated, though, and, and they promised to, to retaliate more, and I think it's important that we all understand, you know, your country isn't necessarily vulnerable on trade, uh, by, by itself. Uh, the EU, of course, as a whole is, is vulnerable, but your country isn't vulnerable in trade. But it is vulnerable if Beijing tried to mess with the supply chain. So, so do you see yourselves as vulnerable if China decides to take their pressure uh, to another level? It is indeed a test case in the sense that, you know, China is trying to make an example out of us. Uh, a negative example, uh, so that other countries not necessarily follow that path. And therefore, it is a matter of principle. Uh, how the Western community, the United States, and the European Union reacts. 
uh, and here uh, it's very important to see what are the measures taken uh, in our uh, direction. At the same time, it's important to see you know, how we react as the community, uh, democratic community, and that we're able to defend our sovereign rights, uh, that we're able to also defend our legitimate interests. Um, and in many ways, though, that pressure uh, that we have experienced calls even more uh, for our joint uh, effort in the Indo-Pacific, for our diversification of uh, supply chains, for our emphasis uh, on uh, uh, human rights, on intellectual property, on labor rights in our relationship with all third countries, because otherwise we're very vulnerable. And, and uh, we are also open to, uh, to pressure and coercion. So you are vulnerable unless you are united. So let's, let's talk about how united uh, the West is over, over China. Um, the Trump administration certainly complained about Western Europe uh, resisting some of its efforts on China. Uh, the Biden administration acknowledged that, um, had some of the same complaints, but say, senior officials say, that Europe, Western Europe is a little bit moving forward. Uh, and, and I won't single out Ambassador Haber, so I'm using all of Western Europe here for a second. Do you see Western Europe willing to confront China the way your country has and the way Washington has? I think, you know, in Washington, it's very important to see the developments in the last few years. You know, Europe has changed. Uh, since four or five years ago. The very fact that in 2019 it has adopted the new China strategy that for the first time calls China not only a partner, a competitor, but also a systemic rival. This is a very strong language for European Union documents. I worked for the institutions for 15 years, never seen such language used before. And that is, I think, also a realization how complex and challenging the relationship is and that we have to look at it from all different directions that naturally China is an incredibly big economic and trade partner. It has become recently number one trading partner for the European Union, uh, but it also is systemic rival in terms of our views towards governance, and, uh, towards human rights, towards the rule of law, uh, towards the data privacy, uh, towards individual liberties and freedoms. And we should not hide that. We should uh, definitely state that up front and defend those values and defend those interests. And therefore, I think Europe is a different place today. You have a situation where a, a number of European Parliament members have been sanctioned uh, by China for their outspoken criticism of the human rights. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, the negotiated investment agreement with China is being frozen at the moment in the European Parliament. So uh, all of those things have happened in the last uh, months or so. And you see much more realization in Europe about what China is today very much, I would say, like-minded thinking what is happening in Washington, and also a very quick attempt to be uh, equipped with tools uh, uh, of trade defense, such as uh, you know, foreign direct investment screening mechanism or the anti-coercion instrument that is going to be presented by the Commission uh, just in a month's time. And it's an important point to note that that, that trade pact was frozen uh, because of Chinese overreach and, and European response to it rather than the U.S. objections to it. So we've been talking about China and Europe. Let's zoom into Taiwan just for a minute. Uh, there is a great debate, as, as we've heard on this stage today, about U.S. strategic ambiguity. Uh, I won't ask you about U.S. policy, but what should European policy be moving forward as we all think about the possibility of Beijing deciding to take Taiwan by force? Well, you know, Europe is, is born, or European Union is born on the idea of peace and, and, uh, and dialogue. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the very foundation uh, of the uh, steel and coal community of really uniting two, uh, you know, instruments of war, steel and coal, into one instrument of peace, the European cooperation, uh, is, is our way of thinking. It's also a part of our DNA. So in any type of uh, relationship, we first and foremost try to make sure that it doesn't escalate to a conflict uh, or uh, to a confrontation. In many ways, uh, if there is a conflict or confrontation, the current European Union doesn't have much role to play. Our real soft power is in trade, uh, in, uh, um, in, in, in uh, you know, soft power uh, that manifests itself uh, in normative ways, transformational ways, especially through enlargement. But whenever there is a conflictual situation, it is really not in the interest of the European Union. Therefore, the thinking, I think, in Brussels today is that we need to become stronger, more resilient, more autonomous on some issues like technological and economic field uh, in order uh, to have a much more uh, stable uh, and predictable relationship with countries like China. 
Um, you have to be respected. You have to also be able to defend your own interests in order to avoid also conflicts. But is it also in order to possibly play a greater role one day in this hypothetical scenario of Beijing targeting Taiwan? You know, I, I would not like to, to discuss the hypothetical scenarios. I hope that it will never come to, to reality. Uh, but I, I definitely believe that for Europe to be credible in the world and also to be a credible partner for the United States, it has to get its act together vis-a-vis -vis China. It has to have a united position. It has to, to become a real global Europe that uh, President von der Leyen has uh, you know, mentioned as one of her key objectives of this uh, presidency of the commission, uh, and we have to do it by deeds. And therefore, China does present a challenge and an opportunity for the European Union uh, you know, to move from just being, for instance, you know, a single market and a trade bloc to becoming much more a geopolitical player. Um, let's move to Belarus. You have become one of the homes, essentially, of the opposition, not only uh, Tahanovskaya, the, the leading opposition figure, but 2,000 Belarusian uh, human rights activists and journalists. Uh, and, and in response, Belarus has launched uh, what your ministry has called a hybrid attack, the weaponizing of migrants. Uh, 4,000 migrants, mostly Iraqi, have gone over the border. Uh, that may not sound like a lot perhaps uh, here, but last year it was, I believe, 81. So this is a, a, a major increase. Uh, the goal uh, to intimidate Lithuania, perhaps even to destabilize Lithuania from within. Has it worked? I hope it hasn't, and definitely it hasn't for the time being. Uh, we have resisted that pressure. We have uh, received a lot of support from the United States and from European Union, from our European partners. It came quickly, it was uh, very visible, and it also showed the, you know, the essence of being in the alliances, you know, what, what is the real